Number 1. Bulgaria The major university of Plovdiv city where I study has a grim reputation for its malicious energy. Back in the day, it functioned as a field hospital, so its walls have seen many agonizing deaths during the wars. A rumor goes around that it maims the lives of its staff with its energy, or only draws in suffering souls to work there. Yeah, great way to describe my teacher, isn't it? Indeed, all of the professors I'm familiar with or teach me have had some great tragedy in their life, health-wise or as emotional trauma. They've lost children in uncanny circumstances, become handicapped or developed a health or mental issue after starting work there. Students have mentioned they've had odd, unnerving experiences around the place or felt watched by many eyes. Some think it's haunted by the soldiers who never recovered from their injuries. By my second year in 2017, I'd noticed the teacher pattern, but I thought little of it. One exam day, after me and a friend had finished and handed in our work, and we'd left the examination hall, we stopped by the toilets to freshen up. Locks in that particular toilet are crap, and the doors are very, very loose. So I do my best to shut mine while my friend waits in front, so no one comes in by mistake. This, though, th this thought comes into my head for no specific reason at all. I won't get out. I... I won't. I just won't. Like an odd prediction. I brush it off, and when I've done with my business, I attempt to open the door, and surely enough, it shakes as if a person on the other side is pressing their entire body weight against it to keep it shut. It's locked solid. That's a first. I call my friend, we'll name her Lena, to move off, but she's not leaning on the door, she says. Now, I'm not a panicky person, but at this point I decided I want her to call the university handyman to get me out instead of having another go at that door. I want to get out of there as soon as possible. Besides, it stinks. Of course I do. So Lena goes off to fetch the uni's handyman to get me out. A sudden sense of panic overcomes me while I'm alone. It feels suffocating. I've never had claustrophobia before at all. I press and bang and the door keeps jiggling as though somebody outside is determined to hold it shut. I feel I'm being watched in that small space. F felt like a stalker is closing in on his victim. And the victim's me. Probably developed claustrophobia right there and then for the first time. Right at that moment, Lena comes back with the handyman and hears me panicking from inside the cubicle. As soon as the two walk in, though, the pressure is off my door and it opens smooth as butter on its own, with ease, without my hands even touching it. My panic slowly drains away and I step back. That feeling of sudden despair and being watched stuck to me since then, though. Now I'm graduating this year, so I'll be out of the place soon enough. And number two, Ukraine. Some background info. The next account takes place at the island of Hortetsya, a very famous location in Ukraine's history because of the warriors who lived there ever since the 1700s. They're called Cossacks and were notorious for a lifestyle of constant battle. From their many campaigns, they brought home vast riches of all kinds and buried them across the island. It is known Cossacks would set up trap mechanisms around the burial spot of their fortunes. They'd also seal the location with a spell or ritual to protect it against looters. This is the cause of many fatal incidents nowadays, when some of the numerous treasures of Hortetsya get unearthed by people along with the physical traps. Legends say the treasure would have its own malicious spirit tasked with killing the intruder if their slumber is disturbed. 
Well, this could be a Zmei dragon or even a specter. And now to the story. My friend Sir Yoga and I had long been interested in the buried wealth at Hortit's Island. We dug into archives, found old documents. Uh, during our searches, we'd usually come across petty coins, arrowheads, when finally it seemed luck was strongly on our side. Uh, that day, we'd set out for Horditza and calculated a spot to dig. When we began digging, my shovel hit something solid pretty quickly. We jumped into the pit and unearthed it, an old chest. We lifted it out to the grass, and to our joy, inside were gold and silver coins. And then, out of nowhere, a large raven dove down at us from above. Sergei shuffled backwards and, and slipped on the freshly dug earth. He fell into the pit. When I looked in, I saw Sir Yoga lying dead. He was pierced by sharpened wooden stakes protruding from the bottom of it. Out of fear, I just ran for the hills, got ten meters away when my legs went numb and I couldn't move anymore. Good thing I at least had my mobile with me, so I was able to call for help. An interview with the person is linked in the description. On the footage, he is sadly in a wheelchair. Number three, Croatia. Part of my family comes from the Croatian mountains here in Istria. And just four or five generations ago, that means around the 30s or 1900s to 1910s, they were still pagans until churches were built in the area and they got baptized. They even wrote in the old Glagolitic script until then. My nana told me stories how they used to worship multiple deities under the moonlight. Number four, Croatia again. Background info. In Slavic mythology, the villa are ghost-like figures with long, billowing cloaks or shirts wrapped around them who cause whirlwinds and have power over nature. They live around hills, mountains, forests, the Slavic version of nymphs, if you will. They are malicious, they kill, and rarely show mercy, sometimes riding deer with poisonous snakes as reins. They shoot through your body if they see you. In several Slavic cultures, the days close to Christmas up to the Annunciation to the Virgin Mary on the 6th of January, are considered unpure because all dark forces roam the earth freely then. Uh, to the story. I am from Croatia's eastern part, Slavonia. There is one village in the region where on a mound grows a single very old apple tree. People say that come midnight on the 23rd of December, before Christmas, villas dance around that apple. In the root of the apple is a large treasure, they say, that only appears at this time, and if you can get the gold without being noticed, you'll be rich. And if they catch you, they torture you at night, rape you, or you'll just disappear without a trace. Number five, Poland and Czechoslovakia. I'm Polish, but my grandparents on my mother's side were from Czechoslovakia. The only thing I remember from visiting them is a childhood image of my babcha, grandmother, standing next to the gate and waving goodbye to us as we were driving away. I was later told by the family she did occultism and herbal healing. She was a sheptucha, whisperer a type of witch in Polish. Number six, Czechia. Ask anyone where the loveliest place in Prague is, and they will more than likely answer Petrenhel. But a warning should be extended to you if you would wish to wander about the hill at night. There once was a pagan grove on Petrenhel, 
surrounded by tall lime trees, and in the center of said grove, a sacrificial altar stood where pagan priests would burn young virgins to the great delight of their gods. During the reign of Prince Boleslav, local pagans were radically dealt with, and their sacrificial grove was destroyed after which a church consecrated to St. Lawrence was built nearby. The pagan faith, however, had no intentions of disappearing, and quite often the gods made their presence known on Petron Hill by starting mysterious and random, yet self-contained fires, in which witnesses would see the grimacing faces of the pagans Prince Boleslav dealt with. These fires continue to this day happening in the evening hours at irregular intervals and last for about 20 minutes. The fire ghost is not dangerous as long as you keep away. Number 7. Serbia I live in a neighborhood that is surrounded with a park and a forest. In that forest, as I've heard, during the Second World War, a massacre was carried out over the Serbian civilians by the army of Nazi Germany. Moreover, I've heard that the forest is a place where the members of a satanic cult are gathering and performing their rituals. I remember that it, it was autumn, and it was drizzling. A match was taking place that day between two of the most famous Serbian football teams, and I being an avid fan of one of them, was with my friends to watch the game. After the game, we strolled through the city and then I headed home, because it started to get dark. I caught a bus which would take me to my neighborhood and which would stop right in front of my building. However, while I was traveling, the driver turned on the heating and it was so hot in the bus that I, at one moment, literally fell asleep from the heat. When I woke up, I realized that the bus had already passed my bus stop and that I was two bus stops away from my building. More precisely, one mile. I thought about what I should do, whether I should wait for the bus to go back or sh I should head home on foot. I told myself, why should I wait for the bus? I'll go on foot through the forest in the park. I know the way anyway. I must have passed along the same path at least a million times during the day. There won't be any difficulties. So I set off on foot through the forest, feeling such confidence that I will, in case I take a shortcut next to a big tree, arrive in front of my building in less than 15 minutes. However, as I was walking, I realized that somebody had put up a fence around that part of the forest, and that it was impossible to reach the tree. So I had to go around in order to reach that part of the forest I needed to, that is, the path which leads to my building. As I was walking, thinking which idiot, for the love of God, could put up a fence in the middle of the forest, I started to hear different sounds around me. The creepy sounds of birds, dogs, and cats? The rustle of leaves? The growling of a of beasts and so much more. The, the, the first thing that came to my mind was that one of my friends taped the sounds on their phone and sneaked up behind me to spook me. We did these kinds of things to one another, scared each other, that was some sort of a game and a joke for us. However, as I approached a tree, the snarling as well as yelping of a certain animal were getting stronger and stronger, louder and louder. Having had a keychain with a flashlight built into it, I reached to my pocket to take it in order to make that part brighter and see what was happening there. The more I approached that part, the greater creeps I feel, but I was repeatedly convincing myself that it was a friend of mine messing with me. And then, the sight from which the blood in your veins freezes from which you have nightmares for the rest of your life. Such a terrible scene that I will never forget it in my life. A man kneeling over an animal, kneeling over it and biting it at the neck. While he was biting it, he 
he snarled as the poor and helpless animal was whining and trying to escape and rescue itself. No sooner had I accidentally stepped on a twig, which snapped when he turned towards me, and I realized that he was covered in blood. The blood was dripping down his chin and staining his clothes. He was... He was drinking the blood of that poor and helpless animal. Out of enormous fear and adrenaline rush, I started running as fast as my legs could carry me. I ran, I don't even know how fast, and at what pace, because I had the feeling that he was always behind me. Not wanting to check whether he was behind me, I continued to run for my life until I reached a well-lit spot where a basketball court was and the forest ended. When I got there, I stopped to catch my breath, and as I turned around towards the forest, under a tree in the dark, he stood, motionless, covered in blood, staring at me. He made no sound, and nor did he head towards me. He just stood there. At that moment, a car was coming towards me. A familiar face was in it, my neighbor. He stopped to see what I was doing there in the middle of the night and why I looked so horrified. When I caught my breath, I wanted to show him that person, that creature that was waiting under the tree. But as I turned around in that direction, he was nowhere to be seen. Having seen I was in a bad condition, my neighbor drove me home in his car and spent the entire night with me. Terrified, we spent the night completely awake. He, since I told him what had happened, and I, who had happened to. Number 8. Belarus. Background info. The next account has been recorded on the grounds of the Gothic Belarusian castle Mirsky Zamok, in the town of Mir, the Grodno region of Belarus. It was constructed in the 1520s by Duke Ilinich. Behind Mir Castle is a large lake. Once, in its place, there was a beautiful apple orchard. In May 1898, the owner of the castle at that time, Svetopol Kmirsky, ordered the trees be cut down at the very time they were in bloom, and in place of the garden, he commissioned a lake to be dug. Since then, the maleficent tree spirits take revenge on people for their untimely uprooting. Almost every year, a man gets drowned in that pond. Number 9. Ukraine and Poland Background Info In the city of Lvov, Ukraine, there are three famed castles connected by labyrinths to each other. One of them, the Zoluchivsky Zamok from the 14th century, is said to still be the seat of one of its old mourning masters, King Jan Sobieski of Poland. During his reign, the city was under the Polish crown. The following information and interview were featured in the TV series Mystical Ukraine, Mistyczna Ukraina, and have been translated by the narrator to the story. It is the year 2000. In Zolotchev Castle, two artifact renovators reconstruct interior pieces. They work and live here at night. During the night, one of the renovators decides to go out for a smoke. No sooner did he come to the window when it was banged on from the outside. The windows were on the second floor. The shadow of a man cast itself on the floor from below. The renovators got scared of this nightly visitor who could reach the second floor effortlessly and couldn't sleep throughout the night. The next night, the occurrence repeated itself. In the linked interview, one of the renovators, Alexander Dovbush, states, It wasn't a very tall man, a, a bit tanned, black-hatted, in a nightly cloak. It was very dark and he moved extremely quickly. In this dark, catching him was practically impossible. Yes, this is the widely popular legend of the Black Knight. The locals from Zolotchev know the mysterious visitor well. Over the span of many years now, there have been constant encounters with the spirit of a black knight 
considered to be the Polish king Jan Sobieski. He is set to walk the halls of his old castle in search of his wife, Maria Casimira, who bore him 14 children and whom he adored. Old accounts of Austro-Hungarian soldiers mention the specter of the queen walking into the smaller building of the castle while it was occupied by their army. They attempted to acquaint themselves with the beautiful dame, but she disappeared. During World War II, the castle had become a base for Gestapo. Thousands of tortured people were found suffering in the dungeons afterwards. Number 10. Macedonia. A very recent account. On the 3rd of this October, 2018, the Macedonian Association for Animal Protection, Anima Mundi, posted a disturbing account of a satanic ritual on the streets of the Dracevo neighborhood in the capital Skopje. It involved a cat brutally sliced in half and scattered across a spray-drawn pentagram with the Latin text underneath stating glory to Satan or ad majorem satanea gloriam and doors of hell open or zazas, zazas, na satanada, zazas. Pictures can be found via the link in the description. These might as well be simply a group of cruel teenagers. Nevertheless, there have been many recent reports of people seeing identical writing all across Skopje. Between the 30th of September and the 2nd of October, it might be the same perpetrators all around the capital, or others from the same cult, if it's larger. Police are still looking for them. Some Facebook users across groups where the post has been shared have realized the cult's been operating close to their homes. One user says, Saw writings like these close to my place too. Gasp. Didn't know that it was some satanic crap. What the fuck? It was only the Zazas Zazas writing without the symbols. I thought it was something related to the referendum. Za, meaning for, was the slogan of the government campaign. The user is referring to the referendum on the 30th of September 2018 in Macedonia on whether or not to have the country enter the European Union and change its name. Number 11. Bulgaria, for a finish. Anyway, I started thinking about the story of a friend. His old folks lived in a village near Varna, and when he was a little boy, he loved going with his grandfather to stack hay. The men would go the night before so that early in the morning they could reap the grass while it was still soft and dewy. Once, they'd settled under a tree and lit a fire, ate and prepared to go to sleep. In the dead of night, my friend woke up and saw some kind of creatures flying above the tree. He describes them as birds, but with human hands, which they'd hold extended to the front, needingly. A noise could be heard as if many people were talking at the same time. My friend became frightened, of course, and yelled out. His grandfather sprung up, covered his mouth, and knelt his head down. My friend doesn't remember anything else. In the morning, he woke up and asked his old man what were these things during the night. His grandfather explained they were, quote, the souls of the bastards, as in children born illegitimately and murdered straight after their birth by their mothers. On one specific night of the year, on the dawn of some celebration, I don't remember which, they come back to earth, and if a child looks at them, they possess it through its eyes and force it to do evil things, after which they kill it. If a young woman looks at them, they take her soul because they're searching for a mother. Special thanks to two ladies from English Philology in Nish University for translating her Serbian story, Ms. Theodore Ivanovich and Ms. Valentina Georgievich. Cheers, girls!
A grand thank you and massive happy birthday to Dimitrie, the brilliant researcher who provided the Serbian story for you and who got Theodore and Valentina involved as translators. Žifi zdrav Dima, and go make some epic Slavic party stories tonight so you can tell us in the next video. If you feel like more stories from around the Slavic world, get subbed. There's more on the way.